Okay, so now we've, I mean, that was already sounding pretty science fiction like it is hundreds of millions of lasers, <laughs> but it's at least something that if, if you had a limited budget, you could do with yeah. current technologies. That's right. Um, now we're going much more science fiction. I mean, if you actually want to send people up there, I mean, one possibility is to just go really slowly and take 10,000 years. To That's take right. There. Now, this is what a lot of people have speculated about, the idea of either some sort of suspended animation or a generation ship. Yep. So you might uh, freeze people. Uh, we don't know how to do this. If you freeze people, the cells break and rupture and you just get mush out the other end. Yeah. But there are animals that are capable of being frozen and revived. That's right. And maybe you could figure out how they do it biochemically and do some modifications to humans to allow us to happen that way. Um, or you could put a whole bunch of people on a really big ship and then let them take many thousands of years to get there. That's right. And this, of course, you wonder a lot about the uh, whether a culture can survive trapped in a spaceship for 10,000 years, having children after children, generation after generation. You just have to imagine how much our culture has changed in the last 10,000 years. That's right. Uh, to, and of course, you worry that uh, a thousand years after you leave, someone will invent a new spacecraft that goes 10% faster and overtake you en route. And so you'll, you'll get there in time to see a civilization someone else built a thousand years before. That's right. <laughs> so there, there's, there's, you get into this really, as you said, science fiction, but also almost ethical world about how much and how important it is for us to do this relative to all the actual risks and issues we're going to have to absorb if we really want to do this. And then the question is, why? Yeah, and so um, it's almost certainly a lot easier to convert something in our own solar system to make it habitable. That's than right. To, to go anywhere else. But if we want to get outside our own solar system, that's the way we have to do it. But people, of course, are speculating about trying to go faster. That's right. So that's something we could do with feasible rockets and lasers and so on. Yep. It's going to take tens of thousands of years. You're going to have to have generation ships or maybe um, try and try gently cool people or yep. have um, embryos that are in artificial wombs that develop into children are raised by robots just before they arrive somewhere, none of which are particularly palatable, but I, that could work, I yep. guess. And if you want to set up human colonies on some of these other planets, that's how I'd have to do it. Yep. But could we go faster? Are there any ways that we can just go faster? Well, and this is kind of the idea of, again, another principle of science fiction, the idea of warp speed. Now, it is grounded in physical, we'll say thought, maybe not reality, but the idea is if you can find ways of shortcutting essentially space, warping space, then the speeds you need and the energy you need, more importantly, is not nearly the same. That in fact, you can shorten the travel distance. If you shorten the travel distance, you shorten the time. That's right. Now we've got, the, this is in all the science fiction movies. Yep. Now we've got the, a fundamental problem that there's a speed of light. That's right. And you can't go faster than the speed of light. Now, as we've seen at the moment, we can't even get anywhere close to the speed <laughs> of light. It's not even a worry we have right now. I mean, the so Solar Parker probe, I think, is 0.05% the speed of light. We have a long ways to go. Now, in principle, you could get closer with antimatter drive. I mean, the fundamental problem of going fast is storing enough energy That's right. to get to these enormous speeds. And chemical fuels are not going to do it. That's right. Nuclear reactors would be better, but that might get you up to 0.1. But yeah. Um, the best possible energy storage is combining matter and antimatter. That's and right. And if you take a kilogram of matter and a kilogram of antimatter, you're going to get e equals mc squared worth of energy out of it, which is you 10 to the 16 joules out. So if you could somehow produce large amounts of matter and antimatter and keep them apart, because if they combine prematurely, you and your city are dead, um, and then somehow combine them and capture the energy that goes out and turn, and these are all massive problems. But we can create antimatter, right? We can, but at the moment it's pretty much at the levels of you know, picograms and okay. stuff. All right. uh, but in principle, particle accelerators can, and so we can explore with antimatter, but we're talking about an atom or two okay. here. All right. So a lot of atoms in a kilogram of Not matter. Not enough to store in a rocket engine. But in principle, you could use some sort of fancy particle accelerators to accumulate enough antimatter. You'd have to worry an awful lot about keeping it safe, because by the time you had a kilogram of antimatter, someone drops it there goes your continent. <laughs> so, so the risks of asteroids we're talking about oh, are the, not even the, the same. <laughs> so this is a very dangerous thing. I'd like to have my antimatter production plant on Mercury, ideally. Yeah, there you go. Um, but even if you had something like that, you have the fundamental problem of relativity, that you can't go faster than the speed of light. And this is something that People ask me a lot when I'm yeah. teaching, why can't you go, why don't you go up to 99% of the speed of light, then put your feet on the accelerator and go. Yep. 
And the fundamental problem is, as you get close to the speed of light, your mass increases. Yes. So uh, this is what relativity found out. So when you get 99% of the speed of light, this is your mass at zero. And then if you get to 90% of the speed of light, you read up that you're nearly double the normal mass. And then if you go to 95% of the speed of light, you're now at about three times your normal mass. And then as you go closer and closer, the line goes vertical. Yeah, and you're not still at one times the speed of light. You're pretty much just heading straight up. So by the time you're at 99.9% .9 of the speed of light, you might weigh 100 times more than you did to start with. You wouldn't feel any different, but it's going to take 100 times more fuel. That's right. And that only gets you up to 99.999% of the speed of light, at which point you might weigh a million times more than you did before. And then you're going to take a million more times fuel to get up to 99.99999% of the speed of light, in which case you now might weigh more than the entire galaxy. So you end up with this kind of vicious cycle where the faster you go, you're actually almost penalized for going that fast. Yes, so basically in normal space, we can't go faster than light. The closer you get to the speed of light, the heavier you get and the harder it is to accelerate. And basically this line goes vertically hit a wall. And no matter how much fuel, all you add is an extra point, point 0.9 on the end. Yeah. And so, so what you're really pretty much then stuck with is, if you're not going to be able to go faster than the speed of light, ideally, you know, you kind of want to be probably below 80% the speed of light, where, yes, you gain some mass and effects, but manageable. But that still means 4.2 light years to Proxima Centauri is still seven years to get there. Yep. It's still very long time. An advantage of getting very close to the speed of light is not only is your mass increase, but time slows down for you. Yep. So if you're at 99 point lots of nines, it might still take, it's still going to take four and a bit years to get to Proxima Centauri, but it might only feel like a few hours to you. That's right. Um, however, it still seems like four years to everybody else. So this is the famous twins paradox. You get Alpha Centauri and back, and as far as you're concerned, you've only been gone for a month. Uh, but your identical twin brother is now 10 years older than you. And now, and this is a real effect. This isn't made up. We've, people have measured time dilation. People have, we have to calculate time dilation with GPS satellites, for instance. They're actually moving so fast relative to Earth. Uh, again, very small fraction of a second, but enough that our GPS maps would not be accurate. But none of our rockets are even up to this point here. That's right. But we can, in a particle accelerator, accelerate subatomic particles way up to 99 point lots of nines. Yep. And so this is routinely measured in the lab. This is not a theory in that's the right. sense of we don't know it's going to work. This is something that's been tested experimentally an awful lot. Yep. But it's not easy to accelerate a single proton up to the <laughs> speed than an entire spaceship with you 10 to the 24 protons in it. So that then raises the question, could something like Star Trek in a, in a warp bubble where you kind of bend space ahead of you, you shrink it and then pop it out the other side, be possible. Yes, this is the idea that uh, we know from the theory of general relativity, which we talk about in the cosmology course, that space can be bent. That's right. And gravity bends space. The idea would be if you've got a piece of paper and you go from one side to another, if you fold the piece of paper over, you could just cut through and maybe do a shortcut through space. That's right. And so, again, there is a principle that you could do it there, but I guess it's that fundamental that we've explored a lot in this course is you still then need the energy to been space-time, that energy being gravity, that gravity being a lot of mass. Yeah, so the fundamental problem is the only thing we know that bends space-time is mass, and to bend space-time enough to do anything like this, we're talking about very large amounts of mass, like black hole-type amounts of mass. And uh, maybe some new law of physics will be invented in the future where someone can find something else that can do this, but all the laws of physics we know about at the moment, and we have got extremely well tested, say the only way to do this is black holes. Yeah. And, and people have tried this on Earth. This is something called the Alcubri drive. Uh, this was a, a PhD student kind of came with this thesis that if you somehow can create negative energy, that this would then, like in a vacuum energy almost, this would then artificially change your space bubble, so to speak, and then allow you to be faster than it. But you have to create negative energy, which we don't really know how to do. Uh, or even what it means. Yeah, exactly. But it's the idea, and this gets people a lot of excited, and you'll often hear, you know, someone from NASA is thinking or working on this. Oh, well, no, people have done equations, and if you solve relativity and you add some uh, negative energy to it, you could get something like this. This is by no means, though, anywhere near the scale of being able to hop in and fly. 
but people still think about it. Yes, I mean, the fundamental problem is that we have the uh, great theories of 20th century physics, relativity and quantum mechanics. Quantum yep. mechanics deals with small things, relativity with massive things. You don't normally need both. If you want to work out the electrons in your smartphone, you use quantum mechanics. If you want to work out where Jupiter's going to be next Wednesday, <laughs> you use relativity. That's right. The places you need both are either the Big Bang, the entire universe, no size, yep. or a black hole, the entire star, no size. And the theories don't match. That's right. Uh, they're like oil and water, they do not fit together. And so you need a new theory, this grand unified That's right. theory, a gut or a theory of everything, a toe. <laughs> and to do anything on a warp drive, you need one of these theories. Exactly. And the trouble is we don't have a black hole in our lab. Which, That's right. Don't get me wrong, is a good thing. <laughs> uh, I would really like one, Paul, I'm just saying, but... Uh, yes, I don't think I'll trust you with a black hole in the lab. <laughs> I, I don't think I'll trust me with a black hole in the lab. <laughs> so, and the trouble is that our existing theories just work too well. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, the, the, there's nothing that we can't currently explain. People keep looking for gaps in the standard model and failing to find, to find it. And maybe if people came up with a grand unified theory, yeah. maybe that would tell us some way to make warp drives work. Most likely, even if you came up with a grand unified theory, all it's going to tell you is the only place you're going to get a warp drive is in the middle of a black hole. Yeah. And, and so I think this kind of goes to this fundamental point that a lot of these ideas, we actually just need to understand the basic physics. You know, we're, we're trying to take three steps down the road where we haven't done the fundamental research to tell us how we can even get it to work. Uh, you know, and it's a good point that people do do these things in labs and trying to come up with new theories uh, to unite these two scales. And maybe one day that will happen. But as you said, at this point, it probably seems a distant reality for our interstellar traveling options. If I had to bet on this, I would say that even if we came up with a grand unified theory, this sort of warp drive is still going to be impossible. And the only places it could even potentially be possible would involve black holes or massive uh, things like this. So this is something I think, I also think we possibly may, may will never come up with a grand unified theory. That's right. And even if it did, it wouldn't help us. Yeah. So I personally think this is, much as I love reading my science fiction, this is not going to work ever. It's not just, 100 years or a 1,000 years in the future. This is a never. Um, even if it is, it's... Maybe we need an artificial intelligence much smarter than humans to come up with anything. And even then, it's probably going to involve throwing the artificial intelligence into a black hole. So I guess that leaves us stuck with Mars.